mean, I, I guess, I guess if the animal was, was very yeah. close. And it was small, but I mean, no, you know. they're very good at it with birds. I mean, they can so what are we doing birds. with this today? I don't know, but we're, he's <laughs> going to tell us. Actually, I, I'm just guessing that's what it's for, and he's going to tell us what it's really for. Now you're and guessing. I <laughs> you am. just told I'm everyone just like you knew <laughs> what it was. And, uh, if you have not seen the morning edition before, we normally don't argue like this. this I'm Susan Meredith, and this is uh, Brian Glassford. Brian Glassford. And, um, and we're glad you're with uh, us. We this have morning. just one wonderful guest this morning. He is yes. from Australia, and he travels all over the Western world telling people about creation. It's very interesting. He is a scientist. I mean, I'm ready to get into this because I have lots of questions. You do? Mm -hmm. I good know. morning, John good McKay. Morning. G'day, Brian. It's good to have you. What G'day did you say? G'day. 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 I like well, that. Well, that's the proper way to say it. Now, teach him how under. to say it. G'day. Are you, can you get it right? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, Susan, you did a, a good job, I guess. But um, the fact is, this is the world's first environmentally friendly weapon. It, it, oh. You can't throw it away, it keeps coming back. <laughs> um, and they're not designed to hit things. See, I'm under conviction. Yeah, that's I'm true. I, I, I'm not trying to make an example of you, exactly. but we really need to get this straight. If you come to Australia and you see a man standing with one of these, but the end is slightly shorter, then run, duck or hide. Because <laughs> that's the one that isn't designed to come back because it'll be embedded in you. Um, but okay. this one... This, this one here is designed to catch birds without hitting them. I did say birds. You did. That was quite right. I was yes. close. Oh, that's not too bad. And the interesting <laughs> thing about boomerangs is they're a remarkable reminder that the Bible is also true. Because we tend to think of uh, Australian Aboriginals, the, the dark-skinned people of Australia, as the only people with boomerangs. But the Indians in India used to have them. In fact, I was recently down in the Grand Canyon, and the Hopi people, they have boomerangs. Um, most races have dropped out of use with boomerangs, but they were in use all over the world. Uh, if you go to the British Museum, they have a big plaque from Egypt, and standing in the middle of a swamp with a boomerang is an ancient Egyptian, just mm. like the Aborigines used them to catch the birds in the swamps. They throw it over the top and it goes, and the birds hear it, of course, and they duck, which is where ducks got their name. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> And, like and, and they, they chase them into a net. But the fact is, if you ask, why did they all have the same weapons? The answer is because they all came from the same place, the Tower of Babel. And they took the same weapons, and many of them took the same words all around the world. So if you're looking for evidence that the Bible is true, then here it is. Mm. In this little bit of stick of One wood that the Aborigines still use. And it is made of wood. Oh, yes, it is made of wood. And it's, right. it's painted with a... Uh, a clay substance or something? Yes, or? the um, the Aborigines have really gotten down to a fine art, the the knack of getting red clays and, and painting them on things using yeah. egg yolk to bind it and things yeah. like that. In fact, it's interesting, the Aborigines, uh, if you ask them where man came from, um, they tell about how the Great Spirit took up the red clay and he shaped it into a man and breathed into it. Now, this is what they told the missionaries. The missionaries didn't tell them that. And again, there's the evidence that the Bible is true when it says that God has not left himself without a witness anywhere. And in fact, the Apostle Paul, the academic of the New Testament, um, gave a lecture in ancient Greece. You can read it in Acts chapter 17. And he said, all you Greek academics, and they were all evolutionists at the time, sadly like so many Americans are today, he said, God made all nations from one man. And the Aborigines took that story of Adam, the red man, because Adam is Hebrew for red, and they took it to Australia and they, they, they added a little bit and subtracted a little bit. Their story about how death came into the world is quite funny. Um, you know, the Bible says that Adam and Eve sinned and, and death was the penalty for sin. Well, the Aborigines sort of give it a humorous twist. They, um, they say how the, the Great Spirit only made one rule in the first world. And that was that he had a special tree and you weren't allowed to touch it because that's where he kept his honey oh and goodness. that was sacred. And uh, the, the man and the woman who were made, they walked past this tree every day and the woman, she could smell this delightful honey and she started to tell her husband, you know, we, we should be allowed to have some of that honey. And well, you know how women are, they just keep it up. You, you know what I mean, Susan? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And anyway, the fact is that after a few days, um, she began to nag and nag and na you know how women are. They, they get like that sometimes. Yes, I understand. <laughs> You're not sure if you like me anymore. 
<laughs> well, anyway, the poor man finally gave up and said, you know, I've just got to get this off my back. I'll get up there and I'll put my digging stick in and I'll get some honey out. And uh, just as he reached in with his stick and dragged the honey out, out flew this big black bat and death has been in the world ever since. Now, and this is the story that's they the tell. Story that's the Genesis got. story. It's really basically mm. the Genesis story. And we shouldn't be surprised because that's the story they knew at the Tower of Babel. And whether they've added to it or subtracted from it, the fact is that story is found around the world. And as I told them down at Vanderbilt University last night, the evidence that we all come from one man, Adam, is built into those stories. Um, and s despite the fact that at the universities they're telling us we sort of all crawled out of trees and lost our hair and grew bigger brains and turned into people, there isn't one so-called Stone Age tribe in this world that talks about evolution, which is amazing. If they're the ones who are closest to it, they should have some memory of it, but not one of them does. The most so-called primitive tribe always talks about a creator because God hasn't left himself without a witness anywhere. All right, amazing. so where did, besides That's Darwin, where did this uh, evolution idea come from? Well, people should get a uh, idea if they read, say, the book of Acts, chapter 17, that the ancient Greeks were evolutionists. Paul couldn't begin by telling them about Jesus. He had to go back and establish something a bit more further back to get them in on the scene. You see, evolution's a really old idea. Um, in Paul's day, the Greek academics all thought they crawled out of the slime. You know, the, 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 the frogs turned into, into people eventually. Um, they were evolutionists. And so Paul had to take them back beyond their present where they were evolutionists and remind them only 200 years earlier, because he quotes from one of their poets in Acts chapter 17, don't you remember only 200 years ago you people knew about creation? And it was a very effective method because you keep reading at the end of the chapter it says several of their leaders became believers mm. because they said, yeah, this man's right. That's in our traditions. We used to believe in creation, no matter what rubbish we're teaching so in the universe. It was and just a 200-year span then. 200-year span. In fact, you think about America. Most of your colleges taught creation 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years yeah. ago. And now you've got a generation who've grown up since the 1950s and they think that they are overgrown apes. No wonder your country's morals are animal-like because mm. that's what the kids are being trained to be. Mm -hmm. How are they teaching in Australia, though? Are they doing um, sort of the well, same? Well, just as it is in America where it varies from school to school, college to college, and state to state, overall evolution is the in thing because any of the Western countries have largely been pushed and pushed by the humanist leaders mm -hmm. to reject creation and accept evolutionary ideas. Um, you'll get local variations, such as, say, in my state, where I went to see the uh, Minister of Education who um, uh, we met together about the teaching of creation and next morning the government passed a rule that they wanted the teachers to be free to teach creation. I've just come down from Canada and we met with one of the boards up there and they want to know how they can put creation back in. Um, I'm not surprised there's this sort of movement around because many of the um, teachers, even if they're not Christians, are a little concerned at the fact that okay, 30 years ago the kids could come to school, now we've got to have regulations about metal detectors to check whether they're carrying guns. And right. the kids are carrying guns because if they don't, someone else will shoot them. Now that's right. where our education system has got to because it's the law of the jungle. You teach the children that we've got here by the survival of the fittest and bet your bottom dollar the fittest are going to survive whether they've got to carry guns. Mm. Now if you want to change that, it's no good making regulations about the guns. Right, that won't change things. It's the people that need to be changed. And you've got to get back to say, okay, we were made in God's image. That image has been tarnished by sin. Let's get back to creation as the basis because that's the only way we can get to salvation. Right, right. Creation, the creator Jesus Christ became the redeemer because we blew the creation. Uh, we've sinned in the world and it's affected education, it's affecting politics and everything. That education, uh, you said you were at Van Vanderbilt yesterday. Yeah. What kind of... Uh, success are you having at especially at that level of education the higher level in the colleges when you go in well i guess there's several ways of looking at it i went to the university bookshop there and i happened to notice that they had as one of the um, course items a book um, exposing creationism 
uh, supposedly is nonsense. Ah. So that when you have a university which has to have a course dealing with what they think is wrong about your opinion, you know that you're at least affecting yeah, them. Yeah. They're going to the trouble of trying to speak against you. So we're obviously making a dint somewhere or other. It's fascinating to note, I've just come back from Hungary, um, and I've been behind the iron, ex-Iron Curtain before, and over there it's the professors who ask you to come into the colleges. Over here it's the students usually. And the difference is because in those previous communist countries they had atheistic, humanistic evolution stuffed down their throats for 40 to 70 years. And if there's any one thing they know, it doesn't work. It destroyed their economy, it destroyed their families, it destroyed their politics. They wasted millions of dollars running experiments trying to prove nothing, and they proved nothing. Um, and now they're saying, please come and teach us creation. So what, Please is, show what, us. Is, what is the agenda of the person that would, would want to hold to this idea of evolution? Why, why would they teach such a thing if they know that this is all happening because of it? Well, I guess you've got, um, say, people like uh, some of the leading evolutionists in North America, David Suzuki, Stephen Gould, you know, all the people who sort of flood the Discovery Channel with their programs and things like that. The average person in the street probably just believes evolution because they don't know any different. That's what I was like. You see, I was once an ardent evolutionist, but then I never knew anything else. Right? That was all I learned at college, university. Nobody taught me anything else. Um, but there are those who know what it does and why they want it done. Uh, I was recently given a program by David Suzuki, um, um, which finished with this line, now that we know we're not made in anybody's image, we're free to do whatever we wish. Now you can see what they know the oh opposite is. Goodness. When you know that you're made in somebody's image, you know that it's God who made the rules and we've got no right to break the rules because God made the creation this way. <laughs> he made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Bruce, so homosexuality's out. Mm. Uh, and so you've got a basic foundational rule. Once you get rid of that first man who was created by God, then there's no way to make any rules. And the humanist leaders in politics or industry or whatever who want to be free to do whatever they wish, they have to get rid of creation. So that's their hidden agenda, which is now becoming more public. What, um, what was the, the point in your life, and what happened to you to make you go from an evolutionist to a creationist, and, or making, starting to make that step at least? Well, I, I guess there's, there's two things. Um, one was um, I was reading a book by an atheist one day, um, and I guess you probably would have called me an agnostic. I, I don't, didn't come from a church family background. I wasn't overly interested in religion or overly opposed to it. Um, the, uh, but I was real mad keen on science, you know, digging up dinosaurs and rocks and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> I've always liked that sort of thing. And uh, this atheist textbook, there was a little paragraph in there that said um, God was just an idea that we invented in our heads and we turned around and worshipped it. And ha, 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 de, ho, ho, these people are stupid. And I thought, well, that's, why did he say that? What's this doing in the textbook? Then he went on to say, well, angels are overgrown fairies that live on the heads of pins in our imagination. Ha, ha, de, ha, ha, ho, ho, people who believe that are stupid. Now, all of a sudden it struck me that that was the stupidest thing I'd ever read in a textbook. <laughs> Um, he was a, a scientist of international repute, putting that in the middle of a biology textbook. And if you just sit down and analyse it, just from a purely logical point of view, if God was just an idea that we invented in our heads, and all these religious people are guilty of is a wrong idea, then the last way to convince them they're wrong is to poke fun at them. Because you and I know that if someone pokes fun at us, we don't discuss it any further. We run away and hide mm -hmm. to where we feel safe. So I thought, you're an idiot, man, for saying that. The second thing is, if God was really real and this guy was wrong, then he was in heaps of trouble. Because the one thing you learn as a college student is you don't poke fun at anybody bigger than yourself. And if God really made the heavens and the earth, then this guy was an idiot for poking fun who could rip the, at someone who could rip the rug out from under him quick, quicker than you could say Adam. Um, so either way you stacked it up, this man was a fool. 
Now, looking back now as a Christian, I'm sure it was the Holy Spirit who was saying, come on, John, think through this. <laughs> think this it. is crazy. <laughs> and so I remember grabbing a Bible. I didn't let anybody else see me reading it because, you know, I was that sort of a person. And I didn't understand much of it. I wanted to find out more about God. And I read it from cover to cover. And uh, all the wither befores and what begot nots of the old King James Version just left me. I, I didn't understand much of that. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that did strike me in this book was that there was something about it that was different than anything I'd read before. And I didn't know what it was at the time. Now I know it was the person of Jesus, not just the words on the page. But it was him who was attracting me to himself. And by the time I got halfway through, you know, I just said, well, here I am, Lord, I'm, I'm yours, just take me. And I finally reached the conclusion after studying the Bible that Christians should go to church and be baptized and, and, and all of that. So I turned up at a nearby local evangelical church and told the pastor what I'd done. So that's one aspect. The other aspect mm. is that in my geology course, we had a textbook by Professor Carter from Cambridge University. And uh, whilst he was an ardent evolutionist, he said you cannot find one fossil group which you could dogmatically claim to be the ancestor of any other two. And I scratched my head and I thought, well, if you've got a fossil, you know, the, you know, the family trees they have of man to the apes and apes to the fishes and fishes to the, the bugs in the sea and the sea back to, you know, all those sort of things. I thought, well, if you're going to make a tree and you don't have anything that joins two branches together, then you haven't got a tree. And I thought, well, this is a serious problem. And then he went on to say, once the organisms appear, they seem to remain the same. I thought, well, gee, that's not what I've been told. I, I had the idea they were always changing and evolving. So I thought, I'm going to see if this man's right. So I determined that I would bang rocks, collect rocks, find dinosaurs, whatever, just to see what the facts really were. Um, in fact, to give you an example of this, you recognize that, don't you, Susan? I do. What is it? Starfish. It's a starfish. Yes. I picked it up from Hawaii and, and brought it to the place. Um, Brian, how are you on that one? Starfish. Except in, in a, embedded in a rock. Embedded in a rock, except the rock's supposed to be some 400 million years old. It's mm. Australia's oldest deposit, even in evolutionist sense. I don't believe in all the hundreds of millions of years anymore, but just arguing the way they argue, that's supposed to be about 400 million years old. Um, this one here, have a look at that, Susan. Okay. Oh, look at that. Now, that's a star. A that's starfish. a starfish, too, except that's also. a cast of the world's oldest known starfish. There's no starfishes underneath that in the rocks. You can't find any way to connect it. And so one of the things I've done is um, collect the specimens to see whether Carter was right. And he's 100% right. So you've really Once done you this more from a science uh, Oh yeah, I've been interested in the facts. Yes. Right? Um, you see, the thing that has struck me about Christianity is, is little verses in the New Testament, like Paul said, if it's not true that Christ rose from the dead, then your faith is vain. Right. Which means that Christianity is not true because we believe it. It, it. You're a fool if you don't believe it because it happens to be true. Um, mm -hmm. It's true that Christ rose from the dead. So when God said he created creatures to produce their own kind, then it doesn't matter how long you think they've been here or how you think they got into the rocks, starfishes would always turn into starfishes, would always turn into starfishes. And Car that's what Carter said. You can't find any one group it dogmatically you could claim that turn into any other two and after 20 years of banging rocks that's exactly what you find that's why we produce videos for schools um, I think you're going to play one a little later aren't you we on are, fossils we're going to play yeah, some comparisons right. of yours yeah. you call them living fossils living fossils because a starfish is still here and it's exactly the same format as the first starfish is even the evolutionist has to agree with that but he thinks they're 500 million years old or so and that's where I really like to turn around his millions of years on it. Because if you think starfishes have remained the same for 500 million years, then you have to admit they're stuck in a rut. <laughs> I mean, if they haven't changed in 500 million years, they're not going to change. They are good at making starfishes, and that's the proof that Genesis requires. God made them to produce their own kind, and that's exactly what they do. Now, Carter, Carter wrote this book, right? Yeah. When was that written, and is there other people that have supported him? Um, well, basically what the effect that Carter has is to force a change in the theory of evolution. It's mm -hmm. been most interesting, because Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of the Species, um, even he admitted the fossils were a real problem for him. 
but um, up until sort of 20 years ago or so, people were taught that animals slowly change with tiny little bits and pieces and over millions of years, you know, they slowly turn from one thing into another. And Carter was really saying, look, you can't see that in the rocks. Once the starfishes appear, they stay starfishes. How did they get from something that wasn't a starfish to be a starfish? Well, basically in the last, say, 30 years, um, you've had people like Carter and that who forced a new theory of evolution. Stephen Gould has now taken over with his idea that animals remain the same and we've got to explain how they rapidly changed. And there's no evidence for that either. Okay. Mm. We're going to have to go to a break here. And I, I wanted to, one last thing before we do go to a break. I know that your background is uh, in science? Geology. Geology. I used to lecture in coal geology and teach science in general. All right. So you know something about rocks. And, uh, <laughs> and we're going to come back and talk with it. We have, we have some footage here, like you said, about some, uh, some comparisons of the old, the fossils in the rocks and the living fossils. Sharks. Good. We'll be back. Uh, John McKay is our guest, for those of you that just joined us after this half hour, and uh, he is a creation researcher, and uh, I called him a scientist, and I think he is. He's a geologist and uh, knows all about living fossils, and it's good to have you here. This is it's good uh, to be here, Susan. I already know you're going to be back with us on the 6th of yes. December. Yes, yes, I'll be back here and looking forward to it already. You just have too much information for one show. <laughs> Most <laughs> definitely. I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and show a clip that we have. Are they ready with that clip in there? Because this is uh, some really important information. It's great and it's really been useful in public schools. That's what we designed it for, mm -hmm. um, to get back to showing them there are facts for the faith out there. The evidence for mm -hmm. creation is concrete, not just imagination. All right, all right. Here is John McKay. Uh, you might find so many of these that you wouldn't have any beach left to stand on. You'd also find plenty of people shoveling them into the back of their utilities. What are they? And why are they being shoveled into the backs of cars? It's a horseshoe crab, of course. These days, one is supposed to call it Kaisafura. Occasionally, in science magazines, you'll come across articles on our friend, the horseshoe crab. The title of an old article in a popular geographic gives it away. It's called The Changeless Horseshoe Crab. The storyline is simply that the horseshoe crab hasn't changed one bit. It's simply not in the business of evolving. And the evidence is indisputable. It's rock solid, in fact. Even the first horseshoe crabs and their tracks, which you find in the Cambrian rocks of Nova Scotia, had the same basic characteristics as horseshoe crabs on the beaches of today. Here's one from the Jurassic rocks of Germany. Look at the horseshoe shape and that spiny tail down the back. Here's a living one again, recently collected from the beach. No evolution at all. The first horseshoe crabs, had the same fundamental design as today's armour-plated survivors. Still puzzling as to what the horseshoe crab could be used for? Well, the Indians of North America used the spine for tips of their spears, and the farmers sometimes collect so many of these things that they simply crush them up and use them for fertiliser in their paddocks, and the eggs they use for pig food. And because the horseshoe crab is not in the business of evolving, they've got a guaranteed source of pig food for quite a while yet. But the horseshoe crab is not an isolated example of creatures which have stayed the same. This is a fossil jellyfish, collected from just below some Cambrian rock layers. Cambria, by the way, was the Roman name for Wales. Fossils common to Cambrian rocks were first studied there. But the point is obvious. Once you've seen a jellyfish floating in the seas today, it doesn't matter what age you want to place on the rocks from South Australia we found these fossils in, you can recognise the dead ancestor of a jellyfish pressed into the rock. Jellyfish, living or fossil, provide no support for Charles Darwin's or anybody else's views on evolution. And how does a jellyfish become a fossil? They've got no hard parts. When they are thrown out onto the beach by waves, they melt in the sun by the end of the day. So they had to be preserved quickly to form a fossil. It had to happen rapidly or it couldn't happen at all. And if the fossils formed rapidly, then so did the rocks they are in. Rocks themselves do not show they took long periods of time to form. Other examples found at the beach, which have retained essentially the same structure, include sponges, saltwater mussels and seaweed. In fact, there is one Cambrian rock, the Black Colm of Sweden, a type of coal, which is almost exclusively a kind of fossil seaweed. Which raises one interesting problem. Throughout the Western world for the past century, 
We have been told that the history of life has been one of change. Simple things have become more complex. Ape-like creatures have somehow evolved into man. Teachers and textbooks have taught it. Museums have displayed it. And fossils have so often been presented as the best evidence for it. Yet the living fossils you have seen, from the humble jellyfish to the weird-looking horseshoe crab, through the trees and insects in your garden, should tell you something is wrong. Let's test your skill. Can you recognize these fossils? What you've seen so far is the tip of an iceberg full of animals and plants whose life history has been one of stability, not evolution. The evolution of life taught to you in school textbooks has not been the real history of this earth. And if evolution has not been the real record of history, what has? Sharks show it. They are living fossils too. They have only ever reproduced sharks. The evidence is in the rocks, in the fossil sharks we dig up. Occasionally, whole sharks have been so rapidly buried, they've been stamped into the mud as fossils. But that's rare compared to finding sharks' teeth, their only hard part. And living fossil sharks still have the same sharp teeth they always had. See these? You sometimes find them in jewellery shops on the end of pendants. They are fossilised sharks' teeth. Easy to recognise. How big a shark do you think this fossil tooth came from? In Devonian and other rocks, there are often so many teeth fossilised, they can even clog up drilling wells. The number of sharks buried in the rocks must be in the billions, but not one so far has shown any evidence that it has or could evolve. The same is true of their cousins, the rays. See how similar this ray is to the fossil found in the Jurassic rocks of Germany? Any fisherman could tell the fossil is merely a dead ray. It doesn't even matter how old you think the rocks from Germany are, rays have always been rays. And how big was the mouth of the shark? At least seven feet or two metres across. It's been labelled Carcharodon megalodon and it grew to at least 45 feet or 15 metres, a cousin of today's great white shark. Where does this leave evolution? Because the same is true for so much sea life, including the sturgeon, the gar, the bowfin fish, the mackerel, the perch and the common old herring. All are living fossils unchanged from their first appearance in the ocean and none showing even the slightest hint they've evolved from any other creature. Anyone who has studied... Mm. We are back. Mm. We, we are, are back. And you <coughs> had uh, a plug you wanted to make for... Yes, uh, if folks enjoyed that, Susan, they can uh, get that video there. It's called The World of Living Fossils. In fact, they can get it quite locally here in Tennessee now. Mm. It's great for youth groups, great for home groups, particularly useful for homeschoolers and tremendous for public school use. And in fact, we're going to put a phone yeah, number up on number the, up. the screen now. I'll read it out to you from here. It's uh, area code 615. Well, that's Tennessee, isn't there it? There it is. Yeah, 374 3693. That's actually a Hartsville number. And all of the videos we produce and all of our programs and wherever I'm going to be in Tennessee and Kentucky, they can find out from that number. I need John, to get we, some uh, more. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, we have a whole list of things here. Where's he, he's going to be somewhere. Yes, he will yeah, be at I'm going First to actually Baptist be at, um, Church yeah, tonight. First Baptist Goodlettsville tonight. Tonight. Uh -huh. Now, I know Goodlettsville is somewhere. It's, <laughs> it's, in our, <laughs> it's in our viewing area. Yes, yeah, sure. that's at yeah. Um, 7 o'clock. And uh, we're actually going to give them a look at the origin of the races, all the evidence that the different races, not just hearing me talk about it, but seeing the actual people themselves. The Aborigines we've videoed, the in North American Indians telling their stories of the flood, all of those things. And um, we're, we're going to show them uh, these, these different evidences. And it's gonna, there's going to be questions. They can ask questions. And if they want to be uh, involved in what is going on in creation research and see it for themselves, they can turn up at 7 p.m. tonight at the First Baptist Church at Goodlettsville. That's right. And right. we'll leave the entire program here at the channel if they want to find any more details for the next week or so. Oh, or yes. they can ring our number, 374-3693. Great. Okay. Let's, uh, is the, what is the cost of, of one of these videos? Um, well, we try and do it the commercial way. The more videos you buy, the cheaper they get. All right. So uh, all right. they can ring the office for all the local prices. They, 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 you know, we, we try and encourage people to get as many out there as possible.
All right. Well, after looking at them now, I was just absolutely fascinated. One of them was about 30 minutes, another mm. about 40. Well, we have one hour and two hour videos and yes. all sorts of things. Debates, it's fascinating. Oh, they were just wonderful. And they, um, I, I wanted to ask some things, though. You know, we hear so much like the Jurassic Park movie mm -hmm. and the, the dinosaurs. You said you had gone looking for dinosaurs. And what, what, what well, have you done in that We had a good year area? last year. We found two. Um, <laughs> it's a better year than normal for dinosaurs. Dead they were, of course, not like Jurassic oh, Park. Oh. But the thing that I like about movies like Jurassic Park, I mean, it's a, it's a great story, mediocre acting, but lousy science. <laughs> Except for, for one line. My favourite line, as I was saying at Vanderbilt last night, is, is the line that most people miss because the thing that catches them about Jurassic Park, it's all about evolution, it's all about violence and dinosaurs and imagination. But there's one line in there that you don't want to miss. It's creation requires a supreme act of will. Now, I'm not surprised Jesus said we'd be caught by the words out of our own mouth because that's in the middle of an evolutionary picture. That's when they were trying to remake the dinosaurs. And if you think about it, if we do ever succeed in making dinosaurs, number one, we will have proved it didn't happen by chance. Number two, it didn't happen by itself. Someone who was pre-existent took the DNA and remade the dinosaur. Someone who was not a part of the dinosaur made the dinosaur. And someone who was smarter than the dinosaur actually got round to taking the DNA and making the dinosaur. In other words, those dinosaurs, if it ever comes to pass, are created. They're copies, but they had to be created because that's how the originals got here. And if you think about it, the movie only proves creation. That's why Jesus, I'm sure, let that line. He probably laughed when they were writing the script. You know, <laughs> drop that line in there. That's wonderful. Now, I believe it was mm. the man that broke his leg that was the one that delivered the line because he probably was the one in the whole movie that made any sense at all as yeah. far as I was concerned. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. He was also funnier than everybody else. That's true. The, 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 it, it's, you know, it's, it's not exactly a kid's movie, but it's a reminder that if, if we play scientists who are trying to deal with life, the only way we get anywhere is if we try and play creator. Mm -hmm. It never happens by accident. All right. Why not evolution? Why not? Why doesn't it work? Okay. Why doesn't it work scientifically or? Well, why, why uh, you've gone through all this research and mm -hmm. these comparisons and whatever, and yet a shark makes a shark and a crawfish makes a crawfish and a person makes a person. Mm -hmm. That doesn't vary. No, it doesn't vary. And the reason, I mean, we can be pretty dogmatic about the scientific reasons it's a little substance called DNA. Uh, you know, that's short for deoxyribose nucleic acid, and you understand that completely, sure, don't you, Brian? Course. I knew I've you would, yes. Yeah. But anyway, let's just call it DNA, because that's become an in word in, in, in Jurassic Park, and it's the genetic code, you know, the genes, not the genes you wear, right. the genes that you got from mum and dad, the, the blueprint for making you. It decides whether you're a cabbage or a radish or a human being. Um, Built into that is all the instructions for building a dinosaur or building a person. And we've been playing around with animals' DNA and plants' DNA for a long time. And if there's anything we've learnt, I mean, take the classic experiment which ran for 60 years. We, we took little fruit flies, because they've got fairly simple little chromosomes, and we've shot them with radiation, x-rays. We've bombarded them with chemicals. We've been trying to make them change, excuse me, by accident. And after 60 years, we've turned them into fruit flies with wings, fruit flies without wings, <laughs> fruit flies that are hairy, <laughs> fruit flies that are bald, fruit flies with eyes, fruit flies without eyes. And we've given up. They don't seem to turn into anything except fruit flies or battered fruit flies. Um, they yeah. produce their own kind. And we know what keeps them. The information is inside them. And if you think about that, I wonder why God would make a world which didn't evolve. I mean, surely it would be much more fun to start off with an ape and watch, oh, look, it's turning into a person. That's, that's really cute. Um, why would God not do that? Um, mm. The Apostle Paul, the academic of the New Testament, wrote an interesting verse in Romans chapter 1. He said, even the nature of the Godhead is so clearly seen in the creation that you and I and everybody else out there from President Clinton down has got no excuse for ignoring God. Now, what does the Bible say about God? Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can be trusted. He's not going to change his mind tomorrow. 
If he says this is wrong today, then you and I can rest assured that it'll be wrong for America tomorrow. So he doesn't evolve either. He doesn't evolve. He doesn't change. So if his nature is going to be reflected in the creation, that's why dogs only turn into dogs and people only turn into you know, people. You um, know, our, our audio, audio director in there, Mira, asked me a question. He says, well, ask him if, you know, if evolution, if the evolutionists believe evolution continues on, what is the next step for man? I mean, what are they saying man's going to turn into next? Well, you've seen the science fiction movies where, of course, we've, we've got so adapted to computers, we've grown long fingers and lost our legs because we're all sitting in front of computers and our brains have grown bigger. And the ultimate, of course, is since we dispense with everything, we just put our brain inside a glass bowl with fluid in there to float it on. <laughs> um, so that's what the science fictionists are thinking mm. of. But at a practical level, it's showing up in your schools in a different way. If man has evolved and we don't seem to be doing it, then we must be at the end of our evolution physically. So the next step is spiritual. So we've evolved from animals to man physically and we've stopped. I have to say we've stopped because nobody's evolving. <laughs> it's They're just a fact. Yeah, they're they're all, all people. Um, they can't see the obvious. Um, so they think, okay, now let's evolve to a higher spiritual plane and they therefore go to mysticism and to new age. If you think about it, oh. they're trying to solve the old problem like, okay, we don't like dying. Now, it must be possible to evolve to a point where man is immortal. And so you see people like Shirley MacLaine saying, well, let's become reincarnated, let's come back again. I don't know why she wants to come back again. Once is enough for me. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to getting a new body in the new heavens and new earth with Jesus Christ. Because if you think about it, basically everybody knows that death is a problem. Yes. You know, we basically have this belief that we should live forever, but something's wrong. And so the Buddhists and the Hinduists and the Shirley MacLaineists try and find a solution. Um, you, you find those in the um, scientific realm say, well, let's freeze our bodies until the time when they can solve the problem of death. Well, they should know that doesn't work because the Egyptians tried it and their daddies are still mummies. You know, 3,000 <laughs> years later, they haven't come back. Um, the fact of the matter is that death seems to be a permanent state and human beings can't solve it. They think it just happened by chance. And remember, the Bible says that we used to live forever. Adam and Eve were created to live forever, but then they sinned and the penalty has been death. And of course, God would be entitled to just let us die. But he loved his creation so much, he, he himself, the creator, became a man who would die in our place. And the whole basis of Christianity is the fact that death is not natural, it's a penalty for sin. And since Jesus has paid the penalty for sin, you and I and all the viewers out there, um, we can just simply receive that by faith. We can say, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. I want to accept it to me and I want you to remake me in your image. And that's the only thing that satisfies us. Shirley MacLaine will end up dead unsatisfied if she doesn't come to Christ because there is no other way to be satisfied except to get back to the Creator who made us in the first place. So, so what, is, what is really the importance then of explaining this by, by the creation, the, by, by science, by fact? Okay, I guess it, to, to give an example of um, of the importance of it, science is not just something you can keep in a test tube. And it shows up particularly in issues um, dealing with babies and abortion and, and all those sort of issues. Um, to take you back historically, if you uh, think of, say, Germany in World War II, do you think Adolf Hitler could have convinced a dedicated Jew to come up with a more scientific way of disposing of Jews? The answer is no because his religion would have told him what to do with his test tubes. Mm. If you were a dedicated Catholic scientist and you believed everything the Pope said, and along comes President Clinton and says, I'm gonna give you a million dollars if you'll improve the birth control pill. Well, you won't do it because your religion tells you what to do with your test tubes. And the fact is, it's always been like that. So the only choice a scientist has is which religion he's going to mix with his test tubes. Now, traditionally, science mm. grew out of Christianity. That's why the man who first gave us our scientific method in 1605 wrote this. He said, there are two books laid before us to stop us falling into error. The first is the Holy Scriptures, which reveals the will of God. The second is the creation, which declares his power. 
Now that was Francis Bacon. We wouldn't have science if it wasn't for him. We know there's laws out there because God gives laws. Let's go and find them. It'll help us have dominion over the world. Now Christianity was the foundation of modern science. What's happened is you've thrown Christianity out of your classrooms. I mean, you just don't have the separation of church and state in America anymore. You have the separation of God from the state. Right? It's changed completely because you've thrown Christianity out of the classrooms and you've brought atheism and humanism in. That's what the importance of the issue is. And you're building a false future for America because you've thrown out the true history. It used to be in God we trust and all men were created. Now it's in money we hope and all men evolved by chance perhaps. So there's no future in that. You can only build a false future for the next generation if you build it on a false past. If you want to build a true future and have the right rules about homosexuality and abortion, all of that, you'll have to get back to the fact that in God we were created. Therefore, and lots of things flow from that, we believe in marriage because God made Adam and Eve, therefore a man will take a wife. Our families are falling to pieces because we've told them we invented marriage so the rules are ours to make and ours mm -hmm. to break and we can't decide what the rules are. And you're making that impact <clears throat> at the level where, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a new light here. You're hitting the schools. Yep. I mean, that's why you, you know, the education that you've gained and the information and the study that you've, you've done and all the research so that you can take this information and get it into the schools I mean, that is an incredible feat, and that's, I think that's where it needs to go. Um, well, we yeah, get into the schools, we make it available to the homeschoolers. In fact, several of the meetings we're running here in Tennessee are for homeschoolers. In fact, I might as well remind yes. them if, they, if they've got yeah, their go pencils ahead. out there. We've got one especially on Thursday, the 2nd of uh, December, at College Heights Baptist in Gallatin. That's, I'm, oh, we came through Gallatin, so that can't be far away. Yeah. Um, so that's at 7 p.m. that night, and again, they can get all the information about the program um, from that phone number and any of the other things we've got for homeschoolers they can ask about when they ring that number. Just keep trying, there's not always somebody at that number but just keep it up. There's the number, 374-3693. And uh, uh, what kind of reaction, what kind of response do you get, especially in universities? Kids are, are they're wanting truth, I think, and, and are they getting it? I mean, they, are um, they getting this? Are well they understanding? You get, like last night we had a pretty crack, pr crowded room and it's interesting to note, like I read out a letter from a graduate, a geophysics graduate uh, from Cambridge University, this is Cambridge in England, who um, unknown to me was at one of my meetings, uh, David Waldron is, in, is his name, and he has a master's degree in geophysics, but he was into the new age. And uh, he wrote me this letter and said, I was at one of your meetings and I found the evidence for a creator compelling. He said he was an evolutionist, but he found the evidence for Creator compelling. So he began to investigate Christianity, and as a result, he, um, he accepted Christ as the Lord and Saviour. Um, but he said previously, mm. I didn't understand Christianity. It didn't make any sense. And if you think about it, why would a university graduate think that Christianity didn't make any sense? Well, I went and I asked him. He now lives in New Zealand, so I visited him and his wife and, and children. And he said, look, I was brought up to believe that fishes grew legs and turned into frogs and some of them turned into people. And so we were just doing our thing, evolving into a higher spiritual plane. And he said, Christianity didn't make any sense. Now, why wouldn't it make any sense to an obviously brilliant young man? The reason is, in evolution, you know, two hairy monkey ape-like things crawled out of a tree right. and they started to turn into ape-like man-like things a couple of hundred of them, then they turned into a few thousand man-like, ape-like things that turned into millions of people that live here in the USA eventually. And if you think about it, if that is true, the whole biblical message doesn't make any sense. Because you must ask the question, was there ever a time, if evolution is true, when there was only one man? Mm -hmm. right? And there never was. There never was a time when there was one man. Sure. And yet the Bible says all the different races, no matter what the color is, are from the one man. So our racial problems are not caused by our skin colors, they're caused by our sin color. And mm -hmm. it's all the same because we all come from the one man Adam. And the whole purpose of the Bible is to say one man sinned, therefore one man had to die. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, that's God's rule. One man sinned, the penalty of sin is death, one man had to die. And to an evolutionist, that doesn't make any sense. How can one more person dying on a cross outside of Jerusalem make any difference at all? 
because one more person dying in the Middle East war didn't make any difference, and yet that's what you Christians are saying. Of course, he thought that there never was a time when there was one man. Now he found the evidence for Creator compelling. He just bowed his knee and said, Lord Jesus Christ, be my God, be my Lord, be my Saviour. You ought to see his family now. It's a real change. It's really great to watch. So yes, it does make that impact. It's got to be, it's got to be rewarding to see that because these, these people that you are um, approaching and teaching are very educated people. I mean, when you go into these colleges, I mean, these people are, they know their stuff. And Would you they, like me to let you in on a secret? Yeah. I you like realize you. modern education has become specialist. Mm. You know, you really go to university to learn more and more about less and less until the end you know almost everything about almost nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the fact is, you must approach most people, even mm. in the universities, on that level. They don't go to university to study evolution because nothing's evolving and there's no money in evolution. So most of them just believe it. So if you are mm. thinking at the level I'm talking at the moment, you enjoy that, that's basically the same level I can talk to them. Because evolution is something they know about only in general. That's why we do our best to try and reduce it to a level everybody can understand. Mm. And as the folks out there enjoying this level, that's the level even on the videos when we do the debates, because the truth is always simple. Yeah. It's lies that get complicated. Okay. We only have two minutes until we have to absolutely be out of this. And this is so fascinating. I wish this show was about five hours long, because <laughs> we'll I know, I know we could do this. But on the 6th of December, yes, we'll be back here. we will love to have you back. Mm -hmm. have and, you back. Um, you're going to be in town all this time? You're going to stay in? We'll be in uh, town the um, basically town. backwards yeah. and forwards in Tennessee and in Kentucky. I've got lots of schools, public schools, as well as meetings every night. And uh, uh -huh. they can get the number from there. They can ring up about the videos to the number uh -huh. we had before on fossils or the origin of our skin colors. Or they can join us tonight. Or they that's can right. join Over us tonight at, at First at 7 Baptist Church, Goodlettsville. And that's right at uh, Dixon Road, I believe, and uh, Two Mile Pike. Two Mile Parkway, okay, out there. So who and the thank you very much, by the way, for for that because you're a faith builder. Thanks, you mate. You have uh, a lot Thanks of information so there that builds our faith. We appreciate That's that. Exciting.